Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Saddleback webinar for this week. My name is Liz Mangus, Literacy Specialist with Saddleback Educational Publishing. We'll get started uh, right at 3 o'clock Central Time. As you are logging in, please locate your control bar, which is at the bottom of your web browser window. And there you will find three very important icons. Uh, number one is the chat. This is how you are going to interact with us today. We love it when you interact with us. So please uh, get comfortable with that chat and uh, go ahead and start typing in there right now if you feel like it. Uh, just one thing to keep in mind. You have to select panelists and attendees in the chat if you want everybody to see what you have to share. Uh, by default, the message goes to panelists only, which is just a handful of us. So if you want everybody to see your comment, you need to select panelists and attendees before you hit send on the chat. The chat is also where we will be posting links to handouts and resources, um, including your certificate of attendance today. And that will go out uh, in an email after the webinar as well. The Q&A area is for your questions, either for Saddleback or for our presenters today. And also new, we have uh, finally enabled our subtitle feature on Zoom. So um, we didn't realize we could do that for a while there, but now, we, now we've got it, we figured it out. So if you are interested in subtitles, go ahead and click live transcript and then select show subtitle and that will give you um, some captioning or some sub subtitle, technically subtitling. So um, that is there for you now on your control bar. We also encourage you to follow us on Twitter. Um, so Saddleback is on Twitter and both of our presenters are on Twitter today. Irina McGrath and Michelle Shorey. Uh, we're very excited that they're here to talk Tequity with us today. So this is where you can find us on Twitter. Let everybody know you are joining us for this great learning opportunity. And if you happen to be watching the recording of this session, don't be afraid to go to Twitter, even though it might be two weeks, two months, or even a year after the event, we still want to know what you think and we uh, appreciate getting your feedback. So let's bring in Irina and Michelle. How are you ladies? We're doing great. Thank you, Liz. All right. So you are on spring break right now where you are. Yes, and do you notice that I'm wearing a sweater on spring break? This is a little disappointing for spring break, right, Irina? <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of chilly today. Yeah, it's uh, the the weather here has been um, fluctuating quite a bit as well. So um, let's check the chat really quickly before we um, start our content for today. We've got Charlotte, North Carolina, checking in, and we've got Wilmington. All right, um, I feel like those. Those of you who are joining us right now, please go ahead and let us know where you're from. We always like to know that. Uh, Chicago, oh good, Chicago is here. Missouri, hi Cami. Virginia, New York, nice to see all of you. Thank you so much. Uh, Connecticut, okay, Canada, love it. Love it, love it. New Jersey. Seattle, Washington, Jamaica. All right. I bet the weather's better in Jamaica than it is um, in <laughs> Louisville, Kentucky today. So <laughs> we're jealous, Gabriel. All right. North Carolina. Hi, everybody. All right. Well, it is just about time to get started. So um, we want to respect and honor your time. and We thank you for being here. Let's talk Tequity today. I feel like with the um, very slow movement back toward brick and mortar, we don't want to lose sight of this issue of Tequity, particularly for our multilingual learners. And uh, you might be here because you're even wondering, what is Tequity? Uh, what are some things I can do to help my learners? So Michelle and Irina are here to um, share their, their skills and their wisdom with us. And um, we thank you so much for being here. Let me officially introduce them to you as we always do every week. We'll start with Irina. So she is an ESL expert and she's an English learner herself. She is an assistant principal at the Newcomer Academy in Jefferson County Public Schools, which is in Louisville, Kentucky. And she is also co-director of the Louisville Writing Project and a University of Louisville and Indiana University Southeast adjunct who teaches ESL and ENL methods and instructional strategies for diverse learners courses. And joining her is Michelle Shorey. She is a veteran language educator 24 years of experience, everybody, across five states. So she is currently a district ESL instructional coach, also in Jefferson County Public Schools in Kentucky. Um, obviously, I'm sure you could guess she's very passionate about literacy and high quality PD. And 
Fun fact, she helped to establish Dolly Parton's Imagination Library in Louisville, and she hails from Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Shout out to our attendees um, from Wisconsin who are on with us today. So thank you both for being here, and I will let you take it from here. Thank you so much, and I'll screen share. Okay, Arena, does it sound good? Perfect. Okay, does everybody see it? Do you see everything okay, everybody? Yes, looks good. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all so much for coming. I'm Michelle. And I'm Irina. And we'll get started. Yes, and Liz, thank you for the introduction. We are excited to be here today, and we are thankful for you and the Saddleback team for the opportunity to talk about a topic we are passionate about, which is equity, and multilingual learners. All right. So if uh, w one thing we know that we have learned from this pandemic is that we always need to check in with each other and make sure that we're all okay. And I think we've been talking about SEL and self-care for a few years, but now we see how very important it is. I don't know about the teachers and the kids in your district, but we are definitely um, in my district, seeing an uptick in depression and just, just folks struggling. So one of the things that we like to do is a two-word check-in. And this comes from Brene Brown, who I think is just, she's our guru, Irina, and I think I've read all of her books, listened to her podcasts, and think she's pretty fantastic. And one of the things she does with her staff um, in her company is she starts with a two-word check-in. And she asks everyone to just say two words, so it doesn't take a long time, about how they are doing. And she gives everyone permission to be brutally honest about how they're doing, and also reminds people that you might have two conflicting emotions, and that's pretty normal. Uh, so I'll tell you, our district has gone back. Um, we started with elementary students a couple weeks ago, and I popped in and I've been helping with elementary schools, even though I work with high schools in general. Um, our high school kids will be coming back on Monday the 5th. So right now I'm feeling two very conflicting emotions. I'm excited because I've seen these elementary kids and I, I picked up on all of their energy and their enthusiasm for school, but I'm also terrified. I'm, I'm nervous about, you know, everybody coming back and, you know, what might go wrong with buses or something. So my two words would be um, excited and also terrified. So if you all would in the check-in or in the chat, would you put your two words so we can hear how you're doing? Irina, what are your two words? My two words would be thrilled and uncertain. Okay, I see inspired and exhausted, disappointed and relaxed, relaxed and nervous, sometimes fearful, excited, nervous, unsure and hopeful, cautiously optimistic, that's a good one, tired and uncertain, weekend ready, um, tired, hopeful, grateful and hopeful, uncertain, joyful and reflective, Tired and uncertain. There's a lot of tired. I can definitely understand that. Tired and hopeful. Yeah. And we know that when things are uncertain and when we are afraid, that does make us tired. Um, I love doing this. I do weekly hope cohorts with ESL teachers and we start our meetings with this and it's been really nice. It helps me read the temperature of the room with the teachers before I start because I don't want to share a resource that's totally out of touch with where they are. If I'm hearing nervous, stressed, overwhelmed, it's probably not a day to unpack standards, right? <laughs> we might need to do something else that day. So I think it's a really great strategy for teachers and with students. Irina, do you have anything to say about it? Well, I agree 100%. Okay, we're good now. So now we would like for you to take a few seconds to view this image. What do you notice? You can post words, 
phrases or sentences in the chat. Okay, I'm seeing inclusive, outside, uh, zigzags, stairs, ramp, alternative to stairs. Um, Ani says that handicap ramp is fabulous because it overlaps the steps. Um, access, um, supports in place to access the building, uh, relaxed outdoors and freedom, different locations, art, colorful um, options, um, beautiful design, creative inclusion, bright. Yes, thank you. Those are excellent, excellent um, things that you have noticed. We included this image because we believe it's a good metaphor for tech -witty. There are different ways to get to your destination. Some people may choose to use the steps. Others, like the lady in the, with a stroller, may need a ramp. The ramp is subtle. It isn't the focus of the picture. It's part of the details built into the environment. And similarly, the tools we're going to share with you today can be easily built into any lesson or any unit of study. They may not be the focus of your classes, but they will definitely be beneficial for your students. And another, yes, and another thing, Irina, students can choose what they need, right? And so whatever they need, it's there. And I love giving students choice. So a lot of the stuff we're going to share today, we hope that you'll show students how to use so that students can use them appropriately. And when they know how to use those tools, they can use them in any context. All right. So there are lots of different definitions of tequity out there. I've seen tequity address uh, gender issues. I've seen tequity when we're talking about racial equity. Um, Irina and I developed this uh, a definition of tequity we think addresses um, what we'd like to see, and that's digital comfort regardless of identity, language, ability, or access. And as we've seen with the pandemic, we have, you know, we've seen greater divides between kids who have technology and are comfortable with technology and those who don't have access and are not comfortable with technology. So today we're hoping to share tools with you and ideas that you can in part then share with students so that everyone is comfortable and has access to what they need. Yes, and Techwitty actually has gained popularity in 2021. And um, Microsoft, for example, just recently published a new course for educators that is solely focused on TechWitty. So if you're interested in this topic, you can take this course for free and learn more about it. Awesome. All right, so uh, throughout our presentation today, we are going to be sharing resources from our website. Our website is ELL 2.0 if you Google it, and we, love, we will of course give you lots of links along the way, and we'll give you a bitly to this entire presentation at the end. But what, what we're hoping to do is show you some of the tools that we've developed that we think support equi equity uh, the best. So the first thing, um, is this infographic called Seven Ways to Support Tequity. And I'm just gonna highlight two of the things that I'd really like you to, uh, to know about. The first one is right here. It's Google's, uh, Google's Applied Digital Skills Curriculum. And Irina and I have been a fan of this for a couple of years, but to us, this is really, really important now. So if you didn't already know, Google has a curriculum for students and you can jump in as a student or a teacher and you can find pre-made lessons and they're awesome because they include uh, basic um, apps like slides or sheets that you can share with your students, but it has tutorials and really great lessons along the way. There are also videos along the way and so Irina, do you remember we used this one actually a couple years ago 
Irina and I taught ourselves how to create if then stories. And we actually made a PD that was an if then PD for our teachers where they could choose to go to Paris or Miami, I think, right? Yeah. <laughs> and it was really fun. And we actually used applied digital skills to teach ourselves to do it. The lessons were really easy. And we've uh, shared this idea with teachers in our district and they've used this lessons, lesson with their students. And one of the great things is it's very self-paced. Students can go ahead and watch the video on how to do something or they can skip over it. But students love to create stories and we know there's nothing more empowering than choice. So um, check out Google's digital skills, apply digital school, skills. Another thing on the infographic, um, we highlighted a lot of tips from a website called Web Aim. And this was a new one to us that we learned about a few months ago, actually from a book called Blended by Design by Michelle, Michelle Eaton. And this website is really cool because they have lots of tools that you can use to make sure that your slides or your website are accessible for kids. And so you might have students with um, differences in vision or hearing. So you'll want to check out this website and they can actually look at the color contrast on your site. Um, they can give you tips on fonts to use to make things more readable. But this site is called Web Aim, and it's been really helpful to us. Okay. So, and now we would like to talk a little bit about digital scaffolds. So, digital scaffolds are an excellent example of techwity because they allow educators to use technology to intentionally create more equitable opportunities for ELs. So this particular infographic shows many examples of different types of di digital scaffolds, but I would like to focus on just four of them. Two scaffolds to support ELs' receptive skills and two scaffolds that support their productive skills. And the first one is Pixabay. Pixabay is a free site with millions of images published under the Pixabay license, meaning you don't have to ask for permission to use them or give credit to the artist. There are no limits on how and where you can use these images. You can even use them for commercial purposes. And when you click on the drop down arrow um, in the search box, Michelle, would you mind clicking since you are the driver today? Uh -huh. Right where it says images, that drop down arrow. You can select an image, photo, vector graphic, illustration. Irina, can, yeah. I'm sorry, to, I need to interrupt you because there's some interference with your microphone and it's affecting your sound. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like there's um, maybe something blocking your microphone. No, I don't. You have some papers on your desk, maybe? Nope. No. Okay. No. Okay. no, can you hear me better now? Okay. Yeah. Yes, uh, um, I, it sounds a little bit better to me, but you were sort of going in and out there and I didn't want everybody to miss this information, so. Um, right. Yes, please let me know I, if, if it happens again, but I'm not sure why. Okay, sounds good now, thank you. Okay, so um, again, once you click on the um, you can select photos and even illustrations or a video, which is absolutely amazing. And this is a great tool for English learners um, to, and, and teachers of English learners to use to help incorporate images to enhance the learning experience of their students. So, and I'll give you an example. Let's say my class is reading about animals and I give my students a definition that says a heavily built short-legged mammal with a shaggy dark coat and a bushy tail. So my EL might struggle to visualize the animal and some of the descriptors may be foreign to them at the moment, but if I show them a picture of the animal, they would better understand what I was being of what was being described and um, what the word meant. And actually the description that I gave you, um, it's a description of a wolverine. 
So the second sample that um, I would like to point out is Microsoft, Microsoft Immersive Reader. Thank you, Michelle, for going back. Microsoft Immersive Reader is in many products. First of all, it's in Microsoft products such as Word, Outlook, OneNote, but it's also in other platforms and apps such as Flipgrid, Pear Deck. We're actually, and, you know, we're actually, Michelle, yeah, here's the video that we created um, to show how um, Immersive Reader works. You wanna mm -hmm. show it, Michelle, if you wanna click on it? <laughs> so it transcribes your words and then um, the great part about Immersive Reader, it's one of my favorite tools. If um, you click on um, at the very bottom next to the green button, well, this one will allow um, students and teachers to hear the words being read aloud. And yes, this is the button. Thank you, Michelle. You can change the voice speed. And if you don't like female voice, you can change it to male. Um, another great feature here, if you click on, um, on the um, A, you see the double A at the top. Thank you, Michelle. You can change the text size, you can change the font and color, background color. Actually, if you click more colors, there's so many more beautiful colors right there. It says more colors right below the green. Thank you, right there. Mm -hmm. Um, you can, if you go to the book now at the top, because that's the most important one for our English learners, you can activate a picture dictionary. It says for the document, this might be too short. Well, maybe. And, um, uh, you can choose a language and then your words will be translated into different languages, which is absolutely awesome. Yes, this document might be too short. Mm -hmm. um, but we absolutely love um, immersive reader. So the next scaffold is voice typing in Google Docs. Thank you, Michelle, for bringing us there. So voice typing is an excellent tool for English learners at various levels of English proficiency. Some might say that this is a great tool for newcomer students, but I am not a newcomer and I use it often. So my first language is Russian which uses the Cyrillic alphabet. And since I do not have a Cyrillic keyboard, when I need to type something in my native language, I use voice typing. And I do still use Google Translate. And uh, did you know that Google's Translate birthday is coming up? It was actually launched on April 28, 2006. So in a few weeks, it's gonna turn 15. So when I moved to the United States, Google Translate was not available yet, and I wish it was. So yes, um, Google Translate is an excellent scaffold for our students, and they need to be able to use it as often as they need. Yes, it makes mistakes, it makes errors, but we all do. But I definitely feel that I would take the Google Translate tool over no tool at all. It helps to level the playing field for multilinguals for sure. And the best part of this Google tool, um, Google Translate tool, is that you can go between the languages. You can preset English and Spanish, and then you can say something or type something in in the language. And then if you want to flip back, you can do that easily, just like Michelle is doing by clicking on the arrows between the two languages. So, Rita, I work with a fabulous teacher at Southern High School. I'm going to shout out Wes Cobb. He showed me something really cool with this. And you guys see this little microphone right here? 
So Wes will give directions. He clicks this microphone and he'll give his class directions for the test or whatever their activity is for the day. And it gives him a simultaneous um, translation on the screen in English and Spanish on the other side of what he's saying. And it's really cool because kids get basically like closed captioning in both languages up on the screen as he's giving directions. So that's, you know, really cool. Um, and I love to see him use that. It's just such a simple tool that really is really empowering for kids. Okay. Anything else with Google Translate, Arena? No, I think we're done here. We can go back. Okay. All right. Okay, so we love YouTube and uh, I'd love to see in the chat, um, go ahead and tell us if you use YouTube with your English learners. Okay, waiting for those responses to come in. Oh, it says yes, always. Yes, definitely. Oh, yes. Lots of yeses. Uh, constantly, frequently. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I think the answer to that is yes. <laughs> So, you know, YouTube has always been very popular with ESL teachers, but I think during the pandemic, you know, we saw that we could do a lot more with it because students, you know, were learning a lot of times independently. And there are so many tools in YouTube that really support Techwitty and students um, making that tool work for them. So um, I'm going to highlight a couple of our favorite supports in YouTube. And the first one is probably all of you know this, but if you click on the CC, you get closed captioning. This is the checkers game where grandson right. and granddad will bond. So as you see, you're getting closed captioning, but I hope you also know that if you click on the settings wheel, we can adjust the speed. So normal speed is often, a often just a little too fast for English learners. So I like to put it at 0.75. That's something Irina and I found really helpful. And as you can hear. Places, meaning people will have more days and longer. It's still comprehensible, but and it's still pretty natural, but it slows it down just a little bit. Um, I was a French teacher in a previous life and uh, just having things a little bit slower in French for me is so helpful. So I know how powerful that can be. Uh, another tool that you might not know about in YouTube in the settings wheel is um, you can also go ahead and get auto translation. So instead of having your closed captioning in English, you could have your closed captioning in Chinese. Hours when they can vote in person. So that might help a student in class. You might put that up if you have a lot of students who speak, you know, one language. But if students, if you have a flipped classroom or you have kids who are remote or hybrid instruction, this is going to be really powerful for them to be able to turn on the translation that will support them so that they can see their native language as well. Um, so we love that. Another tool that is in um, YouTube, when you see three dots right here, three dots always mean more cool stuff, you can open a transcript. So what's really cool about this is students could actually follow along if you want them to listen to the text in English, they could follow along on a, you know, a Google Doc or you could print this out. What I'd like to do is take it and make a close activity where you just, you know, um, cross out certain words so that as students are listening, they have to fill that in as a listening activity. So that could be really helpful. The other thing you could do is copy and paste this entire transcript into Google Translate and then give students a complete translation, you know, of it, of the transcript as well. Something cool that I learned the other day, Irina and I are both Google trainers, and this was in the Google trainer group, and I never knew about this, but when I started this presentation, you know how we got that commercial and there are ads on the side? Something you can do to avoid that is simply when you put in your YouTube link where it says um, YouTube, go ahead and put a hyphen between the T and the U, and 
you get a beautiful full screen version of the video. So if you're doing a presentation, like at a faculty meeting or you're showing something in class, use this beautiful version so that you don't have to worry about ads or pop-ups that may or may not be appropriate. And again, that's just a dash or a hyphen between the T and the U in YouTube. So those are some of our favorite um, YouTube hacks. Irina, are there any I missed? No, no. Those are... Okay, I have to pause here because I know I'm not the only one who is like really excited about what you just said. Um, somebody wants to know if we can drop that in the chat. So um, you have to, you put the, I'm going to type it in there, put hyphen between the, was it the T and the U? Yep, that's it. Okay. Thank you. I'll finish typing that in the chat for everybody. Sorry to interrupt. No worries. We're glad you like it. Okay, and one of our very favorite places, so these are a couple of YouTube channels that we really like, and there are so many, um, but a great place to go is a website called Wide Open School, and they'll give you a ton more recommendations for different sites that you might want to use with students. All right. All right, next slide. And next, we're gonna talk about podcasts. Michelle and I love podcasts. And did you know that there are about 2 million podcasts in the world? People love them and they're easy to access and are super addicting. Once you start listening, you cannot stop. So they're especially great for helping our students develop their listening comprehension and build confidence and literacy. So most podcasts are short and free, and they offer a broad range of topics for all kids, for all ages. And the best part about it that you can stop and rewind a podcast if you miss a word or if you're confused about something, and that is very helpful for English learners. So especially if they encounter a challenging vocabulary, so they can pause, rewind, and re-listen and listen to it again. So the, this particular infographic highlights elementary, middle, and high school podcasts. And of course, these are just a few out of millions that are out there. So we will, yes, show you some. Um, one of them is Kids News. Each episode, as you can see from here, is about only seven to eight minutes long. And the podcast comes with a daily quiz and a weekly review quiz. So Michelle, if you click on Teacher's Lounge at the top, uh-huh. And so here you see that there is a like daily quiz um, that uh, you can, here we go, daily quiz that you can access. So each podcast comes with a daily quiz but if you go to extra credit, yep, there's the one, the one there. But if you go to the right, it's to the right extra credit, uh huh. And here you uh, you will get access to the weekly in review quiz. So it's pretty um, cool place to um, visit and use in your classroom. So the next example is Smash Boom Best. Thank you, Michelle, for taking us there. So it's a debate show for kids and every episode takes two cool ideas and then smashes them together and lets students decide um, which one is the best. So, and you may ask us, well, um, how does this relate to equity? Well, we know that English learners bring their own experiences to the classroom, and often the experiences can be connected to the content, for example, of social studies content or any content for that matter, but then sometimes they're not. And so um, it is important to, for teachers to go over different points of view and let students kind of discuss each one to go deeper into the content. 
because that helps English learners to better understand content and to better understand the topic that's been um, discussed in class. And this particular one, Smash Boom Fast, allows students to see different perspectives and dig deeper into the content. Thank you, Michelle. Can you go now to our, we're not gonna click on it, but it's right there. It's a high school example. It's called Stuff You Missed in um, History Class. And um, this one is for high school students. And how many of our English language learners were not here in ninth, 10th, or even 11th grade? Yes, they missed some things from their um, high school history classrooms. And so this particular podcast can help bridge the background gap while making learning fun and exciting for our students. And again, remember that they can always stop, rewind the podcast. Um, if they don't understand a word, they have plenty of time to find uh, the definition of the word. They can use various tools to translate this podcast, which will help them with comprehension. And then they can also listen to it on their way to work, to school, while they take in a walk or, I don't know, cleaning their room. Mm -hmm. So, and also, Arena, something else I love about podcasts, you can also adjust the speed on podcasts. All of the podcast players allow you to slow it down. And I'm going to tell you guys a secret. I'm addicted to podcasts. I speed them up because I want to listen to so many. So um, when I go for a run in the neighborhood, I usually listen at 1.5 speed. And it's totally comprehensible to me, but I can listen to more podcasts that way. <laughs> kind of embarrassing. I'm a nerd. <laughs> okay. All right. Next, we're going to talk about devices and access. That's another key part of TechWitty. And I don't know if you all experienced this. I'm sure you did. But in our district, when we were out a year ago in March, the devices that kids had are not the same devices they have now. When we went home in March, I mean, that was an emergency closure. We were not prepared. Some kid, you know, we had Chromebooks, we ran out of Chromebooks. So a lot of kids used a lot of different things. Um, so we wanna talk about that and how you can use some devices you might not have thought of. Um, this is an article we have linked in our slides, and this is really interesting. And I would, um, Irina and I were a part of, when we both worked in the ESL office, we were part of a, a big expansion in technology in our, in our district to make sure that we had Chromebooks in all of our secondary ESL classrooms. And um, I'm really happy with the devices we picked out, and I think that Chromebooks were the way to go for the kids and the schools at that time. Uh, this article highlights a uh, district in New York City and what devices they used and just some, some complications they're having. So if you're thinking about, you know, buying extra devices, um, I would encourage you to read this article. It was just in Chalkbeat, Chalkbeat just a couple of weeks ago and take a look at it because there's, there's a lot of things to consider when you're thinking about the right device for the right age. All right. So one of the interesting things, and Irina and I created this post about a year ago, and it was really popular. And one of the one of the reasons it was so popular is so many kids were home using phones as their computers. Uh, kids are really comfortable on mobile. And so we created this infographic just to highlight some tools that work really well on phones. Uh, and um, Google Docs, Slides, those things work not 100% the same way they do on a Chromebook or an iPad, but they're pretty close. So consider if kids have phones at home, those actually work pretty great. And two tools that we would really like you to look at are Microsoft Office Lens and Google Translate, the mobile version. And I can't show them to you now because we're on a PC, um, but Microsoft Office Lens is awesome. It's an app that allows you to take a picture of text and you can actually use immersive reader where it'll read aloud. So one of the things that we were telling our kids was when they were at home, they could use their phone, take a picture of you know, a book or a text, scan it, 
and then they could use immersive reader with it to have a read aloud, to have a translation, to get a picture dictionary. So that is Microsoft Office Lens, it's awesome. Another one is Google Translate. The mobile version has a conversation mode. And uh, Irina and I created a demo, it's on our website, of us, uh, Irina speaking Russian, and we're talking and basically you press a button, you speak um, your native language and it translates for the other person. And I've used this with students and parents. It works beautifully. We had a Somali father come to our office about two years ago um, and I tried giving him a written translation and he was also blind. And so um, using this was, was awesome. I was able to communicate with him orally. So check out conversation mode in Google Translate. Um, I was, I don't know if anybody else watched Emily in Paris on Netflix, but they used it <laughs> in there. And I was like, ah, that's <laughs> so exciting. And if you um, don't have a really good connection, even with your phone, it's still okay because quite a number of languages do not require internet connection at all. Your phone will still work. So Google Translate Mobile with conversation mode will still work on your phone. It's awesome. It's like having literally having an interpreter in your pocket. <laughs> it's great. All right, so the next topic, we uh, want to focus on materials. And we all know um, that EALs come to us from um, different cultural and linguistic backgrounds and their educational experiences vary. So some students have like strong content knowledge while other students don't. And so technology can be used to successfully create equity in the classroom and allow our English learners to gain access to knowledge that they do not have yet. And Michelle will talk about print versus digital tech. Irina, I love that you said yet. That's such an important word. <laughs> All right, so one of the things that Irina and I started thinking about too as we were spending more and more time online is how is print reading different from digital reading? Um, I do a lot of both, and I have to tell you, as time has marched on, I, you know, if I count it up, probably 95% of my reading in a day is digital. Um, I still love a good book, you know, that's how I read when I get in bed at night. But, um, you know, we, we spend most of our time reading emails and working on documents um, and, you know, now that we're spending more time online, we're giving kids more digital reading, but I don't think most of us have taught our kids how to read digitally, and it's different. Uh, one of the things we know is that print, kids who read in print are better at remembering nonfiction or fiction details. For example, you can remember if you're reading a paper book, whether it happens in the beginning or the middle, you have that sense of space, that spatial information to support reading. Um, digital readers, when we read digitally, we skim a lot. Um, and we can get distracted because when we're reading digitally, we have tabs and hyperlinks. We can get extra information, but we can also get lost. Um, there's a great study, um, and they actually used a David Sedaris text, which I think he's hilarious. And they found that kids who read fiction were able to remember more details and um, were able to remember more, um, I'm sorry, people who read uh, pr uh, print were able to read, remember more about fiction. But if you're reading nonfiction, you actually have an edge when it's digital. So think about if your kids are reading, you know, if they're doing independent reading and they are reading fiction, you probably wanna make sure they have a paper copy but if it is an informational text, you know, digital is okay, and there might be some advantages there. So a couple of considerations are, um, you want to mix print and digital. So anytime that you're having kids read a digital text, see if you can sneak in some paper, um, A, to give their eyes a break, but B, to kind of break up the, ta the task. So, um, a couple of things we have on our website. One is a one pager and we have a link where you can make a digital copy of this or a paper copy. But a one pager is a, 
um, a great way for kids to talk about the main ideas of a text and to go ahead and insert images as well. Um, the, other, um, the other link that we have is sketch noting. And sketch noting on paper would be great for students to go ahead and write down main ideas um, and to draw images because when we're using two modes, we remember a lot more. So mixing something like a one pager and sketch noting can be really powerful for English learners. And again, we have links to these right here. Um, but anytime you can mix those strategies, paper and digital, we think kids will remember a lot more. And it's also a lot of more fun. <laughs> <laughs> I personally like those activities a lot. So now we would like to share a few resources with you, content resources, and they're also on our site. Um, and this particular infographic is all about math. Um, one of the um, links we would like to show you is, would you rather math? Thank you, Michelle, for taking us there. So would you rather math includes actually grade level math prompts and we're right now on grade six through eight and students can work with partners in small groups. I know we have to, you know, do social distancing, but if we're doing it face to face, but um, it's still possible. So students can discuss these problems and find solutions together, which anytime you work with a partner in a small group, it's great for our students. So another one, if you could take us back to our presentation, Michelle. Um, thank you. Another great resource is, and we're not gonna click on it right now, but it's um, Study Math Jam. So once you um, have access to this infographic, that's another resource that we would highly recommend. And it includes free interactive activities and they're all from Scholastic. So kids actually get to practice in important concepts, not just in the classroom, but at home as well. So the next infographic is all about um, history and geography. And uh, we decided here to focus on instructional games because games can be a lot of fun, but they also help our students build background knowledge and help them remember new information. Uh, one of my favorites is Cythera Geography Games, and we're gonna take you there. And right away, you can see from this website that Cythera has more than 400 different quizzes in 39 different languages. You can just pick, um, yes, place, world geography, or you can um, select North and Central America and play on games with your kids and those are educational games that, as a matter of fact, Marzana highly recommends to use in the classroom. Thank you, Michelle. So our next resource is focused on science. And again, there are a lot of links here that you will be able to click on because they're all live links. But um, a couple that I would like to draw your attention to are, of course, it's YouTube science channels for kids. And they, uh, this one is just a list of different great science channels that you and your students can use if they want to learn more about a topic. And by the way, did you know that YouTube is ranked as the highest preferred learning tool among kids ages 14 and 23? They love it. And according to at least one study, 59% of teenagers pick YouTube as their learning preference. So anyway, another great resource here that I would highly recommend for you to explore is PHET tool and its simulations. They are amazing. And this site is managed by the University of Colorado Boulder and it contains simulations on various topics. It's um, physics, chemistry, earth science, and those are, can be challenging for our English learners. And so what students can do is to select a topic and then click on simulation and watch it. It's very short. 
but it's so well done. And the best part of it is that each simulation is translated into different languages. It's pretty awesome. Again, I would highly recommend um, that site. That's so cool. Irina, all of these are so great because they're building all that vocabulary and background knowledge that our kids not, might not have, or just our kids have different background knowledge, right? Coming from another country. Yes, and they need to know that these resources are available to them. Some kids just don't know that they are there, um, but they are. And once they know it, they will be able to help themselves to um, learn. Well, um, one resource that we're very proud of and we would like to draw your attention to is uh, focused on feedback. We all know that feedback is powerful and it can help our students to understand their own strengths and weaknesses. It can also motivate our students and encourage them to become better at certain skills. But one of my favorite quotes is actually by John Hattie, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with John Hattie. So when he talks about feedback, he says that feedback given but not heard is of little use. So you can be amazing at giving feedback. You can be great, but if your kids are not receiving it, then your feedback is worthless. It's kind of like it takes two to tango, right? You giving feedback and them taking it, but they might want to take your feedback, but if you are using the language that they don't know yet, they won't be able to understand your feedback. So if a teacher um, provides a written feedback and students just don't know how to read English yet, then they will not be able to understand your feedback. But there are so many great tech tools that you can use. And one of them is Mode. And I actually, this slide is linked to our site. Um, or we can go to this Google Doc document, yes, that we created earlier. And we will show you a Mode. So Mode is, um, we already have it installed. And Michelle, we might be yeah, showing it right there. The way you can get to um, this is by going to Google Chrome Web Store and then you can search for MOT, M-O-T-E, and then add it to your um, Google Chrome. And so every time you're using Google Docs, Google Slides, or Google Sheets, you will be able to leave um, voice notes to your um, students. And Michelle and I are using a free version, which to me, it's personally, it's enough. It gives you um, 30 seconds. So each of your notes is 30 seconds long, which is good. It's always, it's plenty. And if you need more, you can leave several notes for your kids. But they also have a paid version. And that one costs about $39 per year. And with that version, you get 90 seconds. And you also get a few additional features, such as a voice note transcription into different languages. So you have to pay for that feature. And if you have a free account, you don't get it, but it's still pretty good. Michelle, would you like to show how that note works? Sure. Great job on your assignment. Not specific feedback, sorry guys. <laughs> and so, great job on your assignment. And then what we could do is you can go ahead and copy that, right, Arena? Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna exit and I could just go ahead and copy that and I can go to the comment section and I can paste it, right? All right, and then students can hear it. 
There was a great post. Um, I love Dave Stewart Jr.'s blog, and he had a blog a few months ago, and, he, and there was a study he cited, and I don't remember it was three or four times, but he said students who get voice feedback are either three or four times more likely to react to respond to that feedback. So voice feedback is especially powerful, and it's especially powerful for English learners because they can hear your intent, right? And they can hear sort of um, your intonation and sort of what you're saying um, in your tone. So I think Moat is really, really cool. I love this one. Me too, and actually, well, we have used several similar tools in the past, and I personally believe that note, um, your voice sounds natural there. There are some notes you leave and it doesn't sound like you, it sounds like a robot talking, but notes, it's pretty natural and students can hear um, the smile in your voice and or, you know, your expression, like, yeah, what you're trying to say. So it's, it's powerful. But if um, when you go to our um, site and access the entire presentation, you will see that we have actually examples of how you can offer differentiated feedback to your students, which is a written feedback, uh, voice feedback, video feedback, and we have a number of tools that you can use or your students can use when they offer feedback for each other. So there is so much out there and it's just good to know and have it um, in your toolbox and then pick what works best for you and your students. Well, um, we would love to keep learning with you. Please visit our website, ELL 2.0. Irina and I update it every Tuesday at four o'clock. We send out a tweet telling you that we have a new resource that we've created. We have a link to today's slides. It's bit.ly forward slash ELL. That's cap, those are capital letters, 4121 for today's date. Um, and again, we have fresh content each Tuesday. Our new, what's up there right now, Arena? What do we have on our website currently? Well, this one is, yes, viewing. You can, yeah, click it. We'll take you to our site. Would you mind clicking on that? Thank you. So this is the most written, uh, the most recent one, and with a few ideas on how you can support uh, your students. It's viewing is an interpretive mode of communication. It's pretty awesome and has really good sites. And actually, every infographic we create, you can make a copy of it. We always have a button for you to click on the button. You can make a copy and you can modify it. You can change it to meet your needs, but everything we make is free. We create is free and it's available for teachers to download and to adapt to meet their and their students' needs. And we'll have a, a new one for you Tuesday. We're working on compelling input because we know when input is interesting, kids will really listen to it. So we're working on compelling input that's written, uh, written input, video input, and then sound like podcast. So check us out on Tuesday. Well, this was a pleasure. Thank you all for having us. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you so much and I will let everybody know what we have coming up next week and then we'll talk about some questions and some of the some of your greatest hits from today that really resonated with with people so next week we have leanne nicholson returning she was on with us in the fall to talk about high impact reading tools and now we're going to do the writing side of that equation uh, high impact writing tools this is for k-12 classrooms uh, you can register on our website or when you receive the email prompting you to register you can take care of it that way as well and we hope you will you will join us don't forget Saddleback now has Hilo readers available on a digital platform. So you can find more information about that on our YouTube channel. There's an on-demand webinar giving you an overview and some basic information. So look for that. And now let's jump in to questions and comments. Um, the, a lot of the questions that came in 
were fairly straightforward and I just kind of handled them as they came in. Um, you know, there were things like, is this free or where do I find that again? So most of them were, were like that. However, there were two things that came up where um, people were like, whoa. And the first thing was the YouTube thing with the, with the little hyphen. People really like that. And the other thing was the print versus digital reading. So, uh, and I wanted to circle back to this because I think it's so important. Uh, and what you said was we need to teach our students how to read digitally. It's a different it's a different way of, of accessing information, right? So I guess my question for you is, and this, I'm sorry, I apologize in advance, there's probably not an answer to this question, but it's an interesting thought exercise, which is, as we're moving back into a brick and mortar classroom slowly but surely, um, what is the outlook for um, incorporating this notion of teaching our students to read digitally uh, into the classroom, into um, professional development, um, making this a, a priority because um, we've been doing this for a year now and it's not likely that learning with devices is going away. There will be back, we'll, we will be going back to print books a lot of the time, but students also need to be prepared to access and consume information on a device. So where do you think this is going to rank in the, in the to-do list um, when we are back to everybody in a building, do you think? Um, I'll go first. I think it's really important. And actually a book that gave me a lot of information about that was um, blend, uh, The Perfect Blend by Michelle Eaton, had some really great information in it. And then I'm trying to remember, um, Tell me who wrote Proust and the Squid. Marianne Wolf, right? She has a new book. I think it's called Reader Come Home that I also read. And it has some great information about print versus digital reading. And I think the most important thing is to let your kids know that they're different. Now that I know they're different, I approach them differently. I find myself skimming when I'm reading on my e-reader, I find myself going down the page very quickly and I remind myself to slow down. Um, if something is really long that I'm reading for work, if somebody emails me something that's a very long text, I print it and that helps me slow down. Um, so I think that's really important and to chunk it and to have many lessons. Um, some of the things that we put on the infographic are like a head, um, headlines strategy where you actually take the text and chunk it and create a headline for different sections as you read. So really showing kids how to slow down and do that is really important. Irina, what do you think? One of my favorite strategies is think alouds. And I feel like it will be a great strategy to use when our kids are back with us and to discuss the difference between reading online and reading uh, you know, paper books. Because some of them, it is quite possible experience frustration when they were reading text online and they were challenging for them. And now it's good, a good time to go back and have a conversation with students and then model through think alouds that yes, this happens, it happened to me and this is what you expect and this is what you need to do. This is how you can help yourself. But those are very important conversations that need to happen, definitely. There's a really cool study, and if anybody wants me to send it, I can, but it's from Dartmouth. And they looked, that's where they did the David Sedaris study, where they found that you can remember um, fiction better in, you know, in a paper format. But when you're reading informational text, you can often remember those concrete details better if you've read it digitally. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I would like to see that. So you can send that to me. <laughs> um, that's really interesting. And oh, and Allison Newton, Allison, um, you know what, I'm going to write down your name, Allison, and um, I will email you and let you know uh, and get that to you. Okay. Okay, gotcha. Now, um, I'll put my email in the chat for everybody. So if you, um, if you want access to this, then um, Michelle will send it to me and then I can send it on to you. So um, go ahead and email me. Just let me know you were on the webinar and you want um, access to the, the print versus digital study, the Dartmouth study, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's really, um, I, think it's, I think it's fascinating. And um, I'm not sure, you know, 13 or 14 months ago, 
uh, as an educator, I was thinking, hey, digital reading is, is a different way to approach it. It's, it may even be, you know, neurologically, it's a different process. I don't, I don't know. Um, but I was just thinking, we need to get everything online. Let's do it. And then we can try to, you know, gain some momentum with instruction. But um, now we've learned, some would say the hard way, that it's not quite so simple. It's a different, uh, it's a different way to approach reading. So very important point. Um, and I wanted to close out with um, asking you both to share your thoughts on, um, as we move back into more in-person uh, instruction, how much of the digital component do you think is going to remain and remain integrated into everyday instruction? And um, what, are the, what are the immediate sort of professional development um, implications for something like that? Well, I can go first this time, Michelle. So I feel like that it's here to stay. We've spent the entire year, more than a year, you know, learning digitally and our um, um, teachers and students, I believe they found some great points, um, cert, uh, different activities that can be done digitally and students can still have fun and learn. There is so much out there. You just need to be selective and you need to know how to use it um, and what to do with this information. But it's definitely going to stay here. And yes, our teachers will need professional development, and, um, but it's here to stay. Michelle, did you want to add anything? Agreed. Um, I am, you know, we have seen the divide. We've seen this digital divide and we know that kids need support with digital literacy skills, especially our newcomers, maybe our refugee kids are going to need more support. I'm excited to get my hands on these kids so that I can sit with them and help them use those tools. It's hard to do remotely to show kids how to press control alt delete at the same time, you know, so I'm excited to work with these kids. And I want computer labs to go away. I do not want us marching down the room to go learn computer skills. I just want them embedded in all classes. I think we're a lot closer to that today <laughs> than we were, you know, 12 or 13 months ago, for sure. Um, and, and any teacher that was a little bit um, tech shy, um, they got a crash course. And um, hopefully they feel equipped to be able to continue uh, integrating these tools into their instruction, no matter what it may look like uh, in, in the fall. So thank you both so much. And thank you to all of you for taking the time out of your day to, to join us. And we hope to see you next week as well. Uh, just a reminder that Saddleback is where wherever your favorite social media platform is, that's where we are. So you can find us there. And we always like to end with a big thank you for everything you do. We know this has not been an easy school year. And we just thank you for your persistence and your dedication to your students and, um, and taking time for your, for, your own, for your own learning. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Irina and Michelle. And we'll see everybody next week. Take care. Bye.